Um, Caroline unfortunately has lost her voice, so she asked me to step in instead, which I'm very happy to, which, which I'm very happy to do. Uh, we're starting with Inigo Thomas, who's talking on the landscape of the Western Mediterranean peasant kitchen. <laughs> Sorry. He's a long-term writer for the uh, London Review of Books, and uh, he's producing two books at the moment. One is on an, um, um, an Anglo-Spanish art dealer, and the other one is on the representation of the cook. Okay, so here's Inigo. Thank you. I'm not quite sure it is working. Good, good. Um, Fernand Brodel begins his famous book, The Mediterranean in the Mediterranean World in the Age of Philip II, with a declaration. I have loved the Mediterranean with passion, he wrote, no doubt because I'm a, a, like a, a northerner like so many others in whose footsteps I have followed. Brodel went on to, make, to explain what he meant by the sea. My feeling is that the sea itself is the greatest document of its past existence. The Mediterranean is not even a single sea, it is a complex of seas and these seas are broken up by the islands, interrupted by peninsulas, ringed by intricate coastlines. Its life is linked to the land, its poetry more than half rural. Its sailors may turn peasant with the seasons. It is the sea of vineyards and olive groves, just as it is the sea of long oared galleys and the round ships of merchants. Its history can no more be separated from the land surrounding it than clay can be separated from the hands of the potter who shapes it. Praise the sea and stay on the land is a Provence proverb. Odysseus's ten-year journey back to Ithaca after his boats have blown off course is a trial of adventure with its mishaps, monsters and survival. In Bradell's book, thousands and thousands of merchants, sailors, travellers and itinerant labourers make their own journey across the sea of the Mediterranean and the land surrounding it. There are no famous people in the chapter of the first volume of Brodell's book. He delineates the idea of a long durée where things don't change so much over hundreds of years. And most of the voyaging he writes about is about trade. The index to the book gives you a pretty clear picture of what that trade was. Food. Almonds, anchovies, appium, bacon, barley, beans, beef, beer, beers, biscuits, batago, bread, and so on through rhubarb, rice, rye, salmon, salt, salt petri, sardines, sheep, spices, squid, sturgeon, sugar, veal, vegetables, vinegar, vines, wheat, and wine. One thing missing from this index is an ingredient that Northern Europeans might consider synonymous to Southern European cooking, garlic. Also missing from the book is the ultimate destination of everything. Mediterranean agriculture was peasant culture. Peasant agriculture may have been subsistence farming, but it involved markets. Yet economic history, tr tr it, sorry, as Brodo says, trade often involved considerable distances. Yet here, economic history doesn't make sense if you don't tell the story of a trade in, say, almonds, without accommodating for the fact that the end of that trade and journey was the kitchen. There's no mention of cooking in Brodel's book. But it's unfair to level that failure at Brodel because he was a historian who, in 1963, wrote in, the, in, the, in Les Annales, the famous journal, say the kitchen and food history need to be taken very much more seriously by historians than it had been. Since he made that observation, food has the history that it didn't possess 60 years ago. In another book, Bradell asked the question, why France remained a peasant society for so long? In 1900, 80% of Frenchmen still worked on the land. Why did the Industrial Revolution take such a long time to establish itself and to disintegrate the system that preceded it? I thought about that question for a long time, since I first read Brodell's observation as an undergraduate, when I was taught by B. Wilson's uncle, Stephen Wilson, the historian. It's my contention that peasant society in France, in Italy and Spain continued for so long because of the durability of the peasant kitchen. In countless books about peasant society, we are asked to imagine that the kitchen was a hearth with a few pots, a spit, and a piece of rancid pork hanging from a hook the piece which were hacked and added to, it, added to a daily soup. Peasant cooking was frugal, but that was to misdescribe it. Peasant cooking didn't allow for waste. We want peasants to fulfill our own vision of who they were, poor, illiterate, and stupid. 
As Hilary Mantel said in the second of her Reef Lecture Series here, that vision says more about ourselves than the, peasant, than, than the peasants. I don't deny the harshness of the past, she said, but we treat it like a horror film. It sickens us. Each century speaks of the grotesque cruelties of the one that went before, as if cruelty were alien to the present, and we couldn't own or recognize it. We seem, we seem to be doomed to be hypocrites, repulsed by the cruelties of bear hunting while polishing off our factory farm dinners. Often we crave the style of the past while condemning its substance. Exactly so. Peasants may not have had cash, that didn't mean they were necessarily poor. Peasants may not have kept records or written down recipes, but that's because they didn't need to. Historians relying on the written record alone will never see the sophistication of the peasant kitchen such as it was. There were, it's true, few ways to escape from peasant society if you were a peasant, but how much of a choice was that really until the 20th century? It was a hard life at 60, after more than 40 years of physical work. The resources of the body were exhausted. But did peasant society persist because it didn't peasant society exist because of its durability? And central to that durability was the kitchen. In my mind, there's no better account of the peasant kitchen than a rather famous cookbook by Pierre Kaufman called Memories of Gascony, which was first published 30 years ago and then reprinted quite recently. It's a unique guide to, to that peasant society, just as it's about to vanish, just as you could say uh, The Leopard is a wonderful book about the Italian aristocracy, just about as it's about to be swept away. It's the 1950s. Kaufman's grandparents, Camille and Marcel Cadillan, look after a 100-acre farm in the heart of Gascony called the Oratoire near the small town of saint -Puy. They have children, but no son, and the daughters and their husbands don't want a rural life. Many of you have read this book, I'm sure. It shows the centrality of the kitchen to the whole farm and how the landscape of the farm is shaped by the kitchen. Peasants lived on whatever farm produce was instantly available during the different season, Kaufman writes. His grandfather loved shooting, fishing and snaring. He was a born hunter, Kaufman says. Freshwater fish and game were prized occasional items on the menu. In the winter, we ate confits or preserved meats and conserves of vegetables and fruits. The kitchen is as much a place to cook as it is to preserve. Dark and goose fat were the oils used to cook and to preserve. And while not every peasant kitchen was as ingenious as Kaufman's grandparents, his book dispels the, the sense of desperation that many historians think plague peasant life. Country cooking is founded on sympathy, he writes. It's only done well when it's done with a deep, instinctive feeling. And part of that feeling was a concept of knowing the land outside the kitchen door. Imposed on that landscape was a calendar that Marcel's wife, Camille, kept in the kitchen. Time and space were fused together in the household. That calendar showed the exact date of the phase of the moon. And it was according to these that my grandfather, Kaufman says, penciled in days in which all the important activities of the farm should take place. The superstition is, to anyone who isn't superstitious, just a superstition. When, for, when folklore has it that you put duck's eggs under hens to be hatched when the moon is rising, rising that the trees had to be cut at full moon, and the best day to pick the walnut leaves for the aperitif by, made by Capil was on the 24th of June, the Feast of St. John, you recognize that within these ideas were rules about when things should be done every year. Kaufman's Memories of Gaspi shows how the peasant kitchen was a delicate timepiece, a clock which dictated the rituals to everyday life, year in, year out. And few things, in a way, remain as ritualistic as cooking. Kaufman says on his arrival at his grandpa's house for the, for the school holidays in February, he would find two chickens cooking on a spit. Marcel, his grandfather, was in charge of the turning. One chicken was for the house, the other was for the aunt and uncle, who worked at a grocer's shop uh, in the nearby town and didn't, have the t and, and didn't have the time to do any cooking themselves. In exchange, his uncle would leave cakes and the tarts at the oratoire, or some cured, cured sardines. One of these foodstuffs Brodel writes about in the Mediterranean. There never was any seawater fish at Camille's table. The fresh fish came from the river and from mill ponds, and fishing too had its season. Marcel caught the occasional salmon on the nearby river, which Camille cooked with her own goose fat and new vegetables. She had her kitchen garden, a fenced-in domain, but in a sense that kitchen garden extended over the whole farm. Marcel and Camille's contribution to the trade of the peasant farmer was wheat, duck and geese. And Kaufman describes how in early December, Camille went about fattening 
her 100 ducks and 10 geese for the maigret confit and foie gras that she would sell at the market at Florence on the Tuesday before Christmas. It took exactly three weeks to prepare the birds. Kaufman explains how the birds were force-fed. It was a skilled art, he writes, which one was only learned after long experience. Camille could feed a duck completely in two or three minutes, but a clumsy person might take a quarter of an hour to get the funnel down the duck's throat. If you rush the maze down too quickly, the bird cannot breathe, and it's suffocating. Each bird had its own characteristic way of swallowing, and you had to discover that this, what this was and to respect it. The plucking of ducks is one of the most striking images in the memories of Gasly, because Camille wished to preserve the down, the birds were lightly boiled so as to ease the plucking process. They were ironed. The sight of the four women sitting around a fire, he writes, and ironing some 30 to 40 ducks as though they were some handkerchiefs was certainly an unusual one. He then describes what the women had for lunch, duck carcasses, and they're called demoiselles in Gascony. And he'd leave enough, leave enough meat on them and grilled them lightly, Kaufman writes, they're delicious. I was going to talk about another farm, but I don't quite have the time about in Italy, but I wanted to say in the sense that this farm and indeed this farm in the northern north of Florence have gone. And one of the things about this farm in Italy in the last 40 years, the land has essentially been abandoned. It was an original Medici estate. And the newcomers on the land are wild boar, deer, and porcupines. They're seen every day now, but they were never seen before when the land was reared as a proper series of peasant farms. Um, it's said that being charged by a wild boar is a sign of good fortune. I understand that <coughs> differently, having been charged by, by a wild boar myself in the Mugello four years ago. You think you're very lucky to have survived. Go on to a hunt, or the hunters like Marcel in Gascony or those in, the, in Italy. One of his duties was to kill vermin such as foxes and the boar whose rampaging could destroy a field. The absence of waste is one thing that defined a peasant kitchen. Ingenuity was another. Historians of peasant societies, La Durie, Flandre, and Goubert, Duby, and of course Brodel and Marc Bloch, have written about family structure, land ownership, the vulnerability to drought and play. I'm not arguing these aren't essential factors to a society depending on, upon working the land, but it, it, at its heart was the kitchen and how it shaped the landscape around it. Fata in casa is the Italian expression for homemade food, but it was no less true for the land surrounding the kitchen. Thank you.